thank you very much. Um, it's actually just a real, uh, very much a pleasure for me to be here. And it's nice to sit. If you can't see me, then I guess that means you need to stand up or tell me to stand up. Is that is OK? Um, so let me just say, uh, it has been a few years since I've been in this room. I think the last time I was in this room, they were constructing something up above. And so it was a real challenging uh, presentation. So I'm pleased that there's no pounding upstairs. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm lucky today. Uh, and I do, I was thinking, and I may make note of this over time, I think the first time I met most of you was, many of you was in 19, I think 93 or 4, there was a center's meeting that I very clearly remember meeting Susan Tross and Ezra Susser, and um, we sort of went from there in those early 90s days. And I actually remember Anka talking about, um, we, I, I'll tell you a little bit about my history, but we were talking about um, sexual assertiveness role playing, because it was just the beginning of addressing women in the epidemic. Um, and Anka actually blushed, <laughs> <laughs> because she said she was thinking of the negotiation in German. I was on a panel with her. <laughs> so I'm like, OK, I think I'm comfortable here. I was a little intimidated at first uh, coming from the Wisconsin Center at the time. So anyway, I feel a great affinity um, for this place and the people here. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. I understand the norm is to certainly ask questions if you want clarification, and I'll certainly leave plenty of time for discussion. Sound, sound good? Anything else I should know? All right. So let me get my devices correct. I can. Um, while you're doing that, one thing I left out in my introduction was, in addition to everything else, is your long list of mentees who have gone on to a lot of great positions, yeah, including one of our own, Patrick Wilson. <laughs> I picked up Patrick at this place called Yale, which was where I was in between Wisconsin and Duke. <laughs> Good to see you, Patrick. Glad you could get here on time. <laughs> We love each other. We have a very long standing relationship. <laughs> Sorry, Patrick. Oh, wait, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> this is what Kathy is so good at. But for, I know you're going to meet with um, some of our trainees later. But Kat, I know Kathy from study section. And not only was she really incredible on study section, but she brought a lot of humor to the table, which always <laughs> Which is the only way to get through study section. <laughs> <laughs> but she knows a lot about it. So <laughs> You're like, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Um, all right. Well, that said, for those of you that don't know me, you've already got a little glimpse, and we'll see if I can <laughs> see if I can get through the presentation without too much more humor. Um, what I actually, here's what I'd like to do, and I, well, just because obviously I don't know all of you, if, would you just raise your hand if you're like a trainee of some sort or a you know very early assistant professor, just so I have a sense. Okay, great. Um, okay. Uh, the reason I ask that is what I'm going to talk about mostly today is what I um, am currently, my, I feel my research is currently focused on the most. And so that's mental health um, uh, within the context of HIV prevention or living with HIV, particularly trauma and sexual trauma in particular, which is why um, a lot of my work is focused on women. But you'll see over time, I've certainly worked in lots of different populations. Um, so that will be the bulk of what I talk about. But I want to give you like a five minute um, the first 20 years of my career in five minutes to sort of set the stage for like here, here's the stud, here are the studies I'm doing now, but I think that they uh, reflect and maybe this is a function of getting um, you didn't use the word old, word older, but it's a function of getting experience um, more senior um, that it's interesting to think about where I've come to focus now and how it really has an interesting synergy in things I've done over time. And a couple of these things will make my relationships with Seth and Jeff Kelly more clear when you sort of see these things. So 1991, I got a PhD, and then I didn't go anywhere. Um, <laughs> there you go. So. Um, <laughs> Um, so the, I became an assistant professor in 1991, and I went to work with Jeff Kelly and directed the first community-level randomized trial of, um, uh, uh, what was it technically, gay bars in small cities. And so um, I spent my weekends in gay bars in northern Minnesota. Um, but it was, uh, that's just the first site we were in. But when I, I'm going to talk a lot today about a study that we did in Shabines um, outside of Cape Town. And so sort of look for, weave, look, I want to weave through these topics and how they've come to what I'm focused on now. So I was fortunate to be a part of the first 
community level trial for HIV primary prevention um, that was done in the United States that then went on to CPOL um, internationally, which actually did not turn out to have an effect, but this, this did have an effect. Um, this was the very early 90s, and then I took that sort of where the epidemic was going and, and modified that approach based on diffusion of innovation to focus on women in low-income housing developments. And so the, the methodology was at level of place. So the gay bars were the place, the housing development was the level for cluster randomized trial. We had lots of fascinating discussions about, we knew we wanted to focus on women, but what would enhance our methodology and we ended up in low-income housing developments across the United States. Um, and then I had the pleasure of walking Ezra and Alan Berkman through these housing developments because we, um, we were, after I met them in the early 90s at the meeting, they were very interested in applying these models to severe mental illness, which I had did do a pilot study in that population in New Haven, but so anyway, nice. Uh, that picture makes me think of them. So, um, so we worked to this study a similar approach with women and then with adolescents, both to show effect on either increasing condom use or with the adolescents, it was actually um, delayed onset of sexual debut. But I actually um, got into AIDS as a graduate student in the late 80s, mostly because I wanted to provide clinical care. Um, I really literally thought, well, I'll take this job with Jeff Kelly. It's a research job, but eventually I'll get back to being a clinician. Um, and so needless to say, that didn't happen. <laughs> I, I stayed in academics for my career. Um, so, but be, and partly why I went to work with Jeff is I was allowed to do a day a week of pro bono clinical work. I didn't have to totally give it up. Um, and then, the, you know, the doubling years of the 90s hit, we grew dramatically, there was more research dollars, and by the mid-90s, we were able to focus more on mental health, and because everyone, for most part, most people died, most of my work was about loss and grief. Um, my first mental health trial actually was on AIDS-related bereavement, but it was sort of the beginning of getting funded to do mental health intervention trials. Um, and even in Milwaukee, it's a long story, but I part, we partnered with Cal and Lord um, starting in the late 90s, and um, as is usually the case when you do community collaboration, that was due to one person. Um, Arlene Kochman was, uh, I hired her in Milwaukee, even though she was from New York. Um, and so she was my connection. And then we've uh, actually, Patrick still works there today. So um, I, we did a series of mental health intervention studies, um, first with bereavement, then with sexual trauma, and then for people over 50 coping as people got older. But all of the, um, uh, the interventions were based on stress and coping models. So they were different focus of intervention, um, different population. And, and I would say for the mental health trials, the primary prevention were either targeting gay men, targeting women, targeting adolescents. My, my, own, my belief in, in these types of mental health interventions is the model may need to be tailored for the issue, but that it was for heterosexual men, uh, uh, gay men, heterosexual women, lesbian women, there was, they were in groups separated out, but all in the same trial. So the reason I want to say a little bit about the sexual trauma study is it's where it, it's what I, when I began to think about focusing on sexual abuse and sexual trauma. So um, just briefly, what we did was develop an intervention, sort of taking what we knew about treatment of sexual trauma in combination with coping with HIV. And so context, this was the late 90s when I had this idea, and it was becoming more clear that um, a history of sexual abuse was related to um, HIV risk behavior, not necessarily HIV infection, but if you look among people infected, you see much higher rates of that experience. So the, the question was, could we design this intervention that was really a mental health intervention? Um, it was not a traditional prevention intervention. It was very much about the impact on relationships and coping from sexual trauma. So basically, it was a, a sort of a typical Western 15-session group therapy intervention um, compared to, and, and as I think we all know, you do one RCT and you wish you would have had a different control condition or you want to do something a different way. And so one of the reasons we felt this was really a great design is it was truly an attention-matched um, control condition. It was supportive therapy um, related to HIV and sexual abuse, but not the coping skill part. So the theoretical foundation was real distinct between the conditions. Um, and basically, we had an impact. This is on all, all partners, unprotected intercourse on all partners, um, regardless of zero status. Uh, it also were uh, reduced if the partners were negative. Um, significant reductions over the one-year follow-up on alcohol use, uh, cocaine use. 
and based on those two, uh, on the substance use and the behavioral, the sexual behavior outcomes, it's an evidence-based intervention through CDC and SAMHSA. Um, uh, so then, and I should say that just like in the bereavement study, it was developed as a psychological intervention, but the idea was if you improve the coping and the emotional issues, could you potentially impact behavior? So the primary point of interest was could we reduce traumatic stress? Um, but in fact, um, I think it was probably funded because it had potential to impact risk behavior. So it was seen as a prevention intervention, even though intended as a mental health intervention. And this is just a, a structural equation model to show um, that, in fact, gives theoretical support that there were um, over time reductions in avoidant coping and reductions in traumatic stress. And those reductions in traumatic stress were mediated by reductions over time in avoidant coping. So basically uh, supporting the theoretical model. So the reason I wanted to say a little bit about that is because we then um, sort of stepped back and said, well, this is interesting. What we intended to do is have this mental health intervention that might impact risk behavior without doing all the traditional health behavior risk reduction types of approaches. So honestly, um, I was talking to Seth. Seth Kalishman and I worked together since 1991. So Bob said that sort of we've worked together for a long time. And a grant, one of the projects I'm going to show you about in South Africa I have done with him. I actually blame him for the fact that I stayed in academics, just to segue a little bit. <laughs> when I really wanted to like get out of the research craziness and be a clinician, he's the one that said, no, you can stay, you can do it. You know, you can have like in the in the difficult years of NIH, I'm like, why did you make me stay? Anyway, so I was thinking this through about um, this idea that mental, could mental health treatment be seen as an HIV prevention method? And so, so we wrote this model, and it all came out of lift, out of thinking this is a psychological intervention that actually reduces behavior. So we, we put together this model that's sort of testable, but you know, social cognitive theory isn't exactly testable either. So I think we can, um, we can develop models to think about how to intervene and, and look for what mediation might be caused in different ways. So the idea basically is, can you intervene on mental health biologically, behaviorally, through therapy, in a way that impacts mental health symptoms, which is often where we stop in terms of looking at what our primary outcomes are, things like substance use, stress and coping, psychological distress. But the idea was that generated from LIFT, um, and the reason I made the reference to Seth is I said, you know, do you, can you think of that many studies that are mental health oriented that actually look at sexual behavior outcomes? Um, and a, some of this thinking was in healthy living. I was in healthy living in the early years, so a lot of people you know, may, around the table know or were involved in healthy living. But it's that kind of idea that you're intervening on mental health and having potential impacts on sexual risk reduction, or certainly now a focus on adherence. And you know, Steve Saffron's work is probably the best known for that, of treating depression and improving adherence. But this was the idea we came up with a few years ago to, that really guides what I feel like I'm doing now, this notion of improving mental health, but is it possible to impact risk behavior, adherence, potentially reducing viral load, and, and, and then reducing um, transmission of the virus itself. So we know, of course, that um, psychological issues like this don't happen in a vacuum, um, and that we think of them much more. We think of syndemics from context, I think, but we also can think about synergy between these various factors. So. Um, uh, this was, a, I think this is a good model adapted from one particular author, but I think we all think about this in interesting ways, that given my interest in trauma and violence, if you think about what happens in there, yes, there's childhood abuse, current violence. Um, I'll talk about food insufficiency a little bit in the context of um, working in South Africa, but that can certainly apply to parts of the United States as well. Um, mental health specifically interested in things like PTSD and depression, interacting with substance use, and then how does HIV risk and impact all of that. So, so this, this idea of psychological issues occurring in a syndemic and how that relates to HIV um, is, is uh, sort of where my thinking is now and um, is reflected in, this is actually the very first project I did in South Africa in I think 2001. So my, my other um, mentee that you guys might know, this is Ashley Fox hiding out back there in the corner. She got her PhD from Social Medical Sciences here. <laughs> Just in case any of you know her, but it's a very old photo because it's a very, it was this was done with Paula in Johannesburg, and it's a, it's called People Opposing Women Abuse. It's a domestic uh, violence and rape crisis center, and so I just wanted to, in making the switch to South Africa, 
Erica, I wanted to say that it really was at the time I was doing Lyft and interested in sexual trauma. And the idea was, in some ways this was one of my, um, I would say, most successful community collaborations. I mean, you'll note from the studies I've been talking about, they're all community-based or either community health center-based or sometimes like in the um, developments and in the um, bars and, and now in Shabin's, um, that they're truly community-based. And this was a very, the, the idea was, um, when a woman comes in having been raped or in a domestic violence situation, is this a good time to do HIV prevention or a really bad time? <laughs> and so it was a pilot study to because you could make an argument that when someone's when a woman's in an abusive relationship, the act of you know, seeking out help and coming for services, either in a drop-in clinic like this or various places they had in had like six sites in townships outside of Johannesburg. Um, is that a good time to talk about HIV prevention? Uh, you, you could argue that it's sort of a, and I'll refer to this later, a window of opportunity because it's like the beginning of trying to potentially affect change or that it's such an overwhelming experience that the last thing a woman would want to hear about is HIV risk when she's coming in for domestic violence. So so just briefly, I would say, and we, what, one of the reasons it was such a great collaboration was um, partly because of this issue of what's the control condition <laughs> and how can you be doing a study in this setting and potentially not giving the control condition some kind of intervention. So we landed on a dosage intervention. I'm happy to come back to this, but that everybody got some treatment. They either got like a once off for a full day or they got multiple sessions. Um, but it was the best intervention retention and exposure I've ever had in a study. Um, the, the women came, they came to all the sessions. Some of them were in shelters and so they were, you know, they were easier to access, but not all. And so it was a remarkable experience for me to think, is this really ethically inappropriate to be trying to do a study here and adding HIV in it? Just, um, and as my first experience working in South Africa, it was really rewarding to do it collaboratively and, and to think about. Yeah. Well, um, they could be either. They, so the, idea what, the idea was prevention. The question was, were they HIV positive or, or, or did they know? Was it focused on HIV positivity? No. So they were not, fo it wasn't intended for HIV positive people. There certainly could have been HIV positive women there. Um, and it is interesting, though, it was a, wasn't a large study, but the preliminary findings, the greatest effect really was for deciding to end a relationship. I mean, it was an interesting way to think about what, 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 are, what are the outcomes we're looking for in HIV prevention. Is it reasonable to think that there's going to be an increase in condom use in an abusive situation like this? And so um, we decided to look at whether the relationship, you know, ended. And that, not that we're saying they all should end, but women were coming to get out of a relationship. And so it's a little different from what you were asking, but it's related to this question of like, what did we focus on? Um, and we certainly talked about HIV some, but it was 2000. 2001, I think, so it was very oriented towards prevention, primary prevention. Um, so let me segue into what I really want. I'm just going to check my time. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so what I want to talk about most is this study that I actually have, uh, we just recently finished that I did with Seth Kalishman and Donald Skinner at Stellenbosch, which ties a lot of these ideas together. Um, and it's, it's um, it was funded by NIAAA and it's focused on alcohol and HIV related risk among women um, in the South African context. And the way, um, and I will say that this is, I'll come to details in a second, but it is the only, um, Every study I think I've ever done since my dissertation was a randomized controlled intervention trial. <laughs> so I had never done any kind of study that wasn't an intervention outcome study. Um, and in between the power study and this, I worked with Brian Forsythe, some of you people might know him, in a family-oriented intervention. We did some work with pregnant women and then their children. And so there were a number of studies in between these uh, two that I'm talking about that were focused on women that also helped me to sort of formulate what these studies would be about. So, um, but this is a multi-method longitudinal study that's not an intervention outcome. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to do. I don't know, I waited 25 years before ever I did something that wasn't an RCT. Um, but the argument that um, actually Seth had the nerve to make was basically to say he had 
done in, he had done an RCT to reduce alcohol use in similar settings, had done an RCT to reduce uh, gender violence. They both had short-term outcomes that weren't maintained. And so the argument that we made was we think we know what we're doing in RCTs. We've done effective ones before, and we clearly need to know more about this context because sort of that our typical type of intervention maybe isn't working here or, or could work in a better uh, better way. Um, so we um, uh, these may look like familiar sites to some of you. This, we did this particular study in one township outside of Cape Town. Um, and we were we used the place methodology to identify the sites um, where we were looking um, for a combination of small and large venues. And for those of you that know the area, you'll say, well, oops, sorry. Those of you who've been to the area will say, well, this doesn't look like a traditional shebeen. Um, this is the nicest one we were probably in. There were a couple. This one actually served food. Um, in contrast, they're much more likely to look like. Um, uh, a room added onto a house or a garage used to sell um, alcohol illegally. Many of them are not licensed, but we we just tried to give a sense of. Um, uh, so actually, there's other cases like this. This is probably a much more common. These are much more common for what they look like. I jumped over those in case you aren't familiar with sort of what the setting is. But some have you know some like games like you would think of in a tavern, and a couple of them serve food. But the idea was um, that there were certain criteria. We wanted to be sure there was at least 10% women coming into these. We wanted to understand the context of what was happening that was contributing to risk. Um, you know, there's some obvious things, obviously, like alcohol. But and so there, are, I'll show you. But very high rates of alcohol use. Um, but from the methodological perspective, we picked 12 venues, um, six small and six large. I'm going to focus, um, we've actually written a lot of papers from this study, and a, a lot of ours have been focused on the mental health component of it. So this, this looks a lot like that model I was referring to about how does mental health relate to risk behavior and HIV prevention. So. Um, I was particularly interested in issues related to trauma and mental health and gender-based violence as it relates to risk for women and alcohol. So it actually, the theoretical foundation for the overall project was social action theory, because we also wanted to think about issues related to structure and so on. But maybe when Seth comes, he can talk about those data. I'm going to talk about the mental health data. No, some of yes, you're smiling. <laughs> yeah. like you're bringing all this stuff together that, that you think about. That we think about yeah. in a really beautiful way. So Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Claude. Um, so let me tell you about the method. So basically, it's a qualitative and quantitative study. It uh, has four parts to it. The qualitative, um, and I should have brought like a timeline. Um, it, it worked out beautifully to be in 12 sites and planned to be in each one over a 48-week period. So being in like two at a time, but moving every four weeks. So we would, um, we would go through the sequence I have here four times in a year. We were first in six venues, then in six other venues. And so we did ethnography. We did observation of what was happening in there, understanding the patterns, knowing venues uh, differ. We did a number of in-depth interviews, qualitative interviews, Views, um, that we first started as we were identifying people to speak with by basically integrating ourselves into the venues. Um, a total of 159 of those over time, but some of those were follow-up after, did some with men, did some with the owners of the um, Shabins. And then we, let's see, so we, we, we hung out for a couple weeks, we started identifying key people, and then we did cross-sectional surveys in the Shabins. So this takes me back to 1992 when we did the gay bar studies, getting used to standing there, hanging out, getting people to do surveys in a bar, and all of the complexities that go with that. But I mastered that 20 years before, so that wasn't so hard. And Seth was actually doing an RCT of a different intervention in venues. So we, I'm certainly happy to talk about what it was like to do that, but um, so it wasn't as that difficult to do the surveys. And then through that, when a woman would complete a survey, we would ask her if she would be willing to, to join a cohort study and do a, um, a much um, more extensive um, uh, uh, interview, Cassie interview. Um, so let me just tell you, I mean, what I'm going to do is give you a couple of examples of findings from that and then try to say where I think that takes us. So the um, Melissa Watt took the lead on this. Um, 
she, these qualitative people, they are so good at coming up with titles. You know, there's <laughs> um, because he's bought for her, he wants to sleep with her was the theme of the issues here. Um, and it's this idea of if, you, if a woman accepts alcohol, that there's this social script that occurs that's related to what we call sexual access, assuming sexual access. So here's a quote from one of the men. Um, you drink from me, I also drink from you. So if I get you a drink, I get, if I buy a drink for you, then I get to drink from you. I get to have you in a sexual way. Um, and so we think of this as this implicit agreement and a social script that's somewhat about flirtation, women being sort of willing to be enticed, knowing that doing that and, and getting alcohol results in this sum. Um, the man basically agrees to buy and the woman is agreeing to have sex with him. Um, agreeing as you know there are lots of factors that influence why women are doing this so i'm just wanting to say i just want to give these examples to get a sense of um of what we think happens in this exchange and so this is a, a quote from a woman where she says that you do understand that you used his money and you're concerned about disease so it's not like someone does this um, with ignorance, um, but all of these other influences affect whether this happens. And then, of course, we get into issues of concurrent partnerships, um, forced sex. Here's a quote about a concurrent partnership. Um, it's easy to get a woman if you get money. You just have to buy a few drinks, and there you go. So that's, that's what a man is saying. Um, and then from a woman's point of view, at times men just refuse to use a condom despite all your pleas, but what can you do? I mean, you did use their money. So it's, it's sort of, it's always great to get the, not great, but it's helpful to get these quotes to help think through like what, what's happening in this exchange and what does that mean about how we might want to intervene. So moving to some things from the cross-sectional surveys. Um, so uh, like I said, we every four months went into back into the same venue. Um, so 12 venues, four times each year, took not more than 15 minutes. People could fill them out written, but we would also um, do them as an interview for illiteracy, or if someone just preferred to do that. Um, we had 93% of people willing to do the surveys in the context of the Shabin um, range. Nobody ever under 85% to almost 100%. And, and looking at unique cases, because I might go there all the time, and I may have done the survey four times, um, with, in a somewhat you know, reliable way, not fully reliable, trying to se separate out the unique cases. We had about 5,000 5, unique cases. So this is just the cover sheet to give you a sense of what we asked. Um, substance use, some mental health questions, sexual behavior, of course, HIV questions, and a lot about norms and attitudes, because we were trying to understand the social and structural context. Um, the methodology for the cohort, the women's cohort, again, so they would do the cross-sectional survey, we would ask. We had this goal of, I think we had the goal, and again, the, the Shabin sizes vary, um, but we were hoping to get, I think it was like 25 women per venue. We ended up getting a total of 560, so that's like 50 per venue, almost. Um, of those asked, 94% said they would do it. And this is the most amazing thing. We could just stop right here. And, yeah. but I could, or I could show you the data that we followed these women for 95% of, of them. I would like to know what the incentive is. So I figured you would ask that. So it was approximately probably eight US card for um, like use in a store. But it had a, definitely had a monetary value. Um, so I know there's, we can have, there's been some interesting discussions about that and how it relates to studies. We, we, but yes, we can talk about that later. But we did give a monetary incentive for the following of them. I think it brought people in, but I think that you could always find somebody with a cell phone. And we, this is, to me, this is a matter of staff who know how to work in the community, that from the community. The other thing that we think helped was remember that the sequence went, we observed. We, did cross-sectional surveys, then it was time to do the cohort assessment. So we basically spend three weeks in the venues and we see most of them, right? And so it's, it's more that um, because it was a multi-method study, I think our staff were so integrated into these settings, it wasn't as hard to find them. And they felt connected in a way that they then would respond to calls and so on. So this was, it was, I think I can say, it was in Delft. It was outside of Cape Town. Delft, outside of Cape Town. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so, and, and because they came in, sorry, got myself wrapped up. Because they came in to do the, um, how did I do this? Sorry. 
got under the wheel, sorry. <laughs> um, moved to back up too much. So this, um, so obviously we had a great recruitment and retention rate. We were able to give more standardized scales, like for PTSD and give the CESD for depression, ask much more about violence um, and more details about alcohol. So I'm just going to give you a few of our findings. Um, let me just check time. OK, stop about 10.30. Ish. 1040. 1040. 1040. Okay. Okay. So I'll just give you a glimmering of some of the papers that we've done. The other thing that we did, uh, um, we had always what we called the back page. So we had the survey for the cross-sectional survey of what we were asking every time. But then we would say, we had this interesting idea, well, what if we want to ask this and we didn't put this into the survey? So we made this agreement that like we'd add one page to every survey. And so obviously this one is done with one of the back pages with 700 people, not the 5,000 people. But it allowed us to, at any time point, have some additional um, it, and it ranged everything from beliefs on circumcision to uh, more mental health to policing questions. It was like each of the investigators could generate ideas that they would want to add. And so, so this one that I'm going to show you, we added a few more um, mental health questions. It was the first back page that we did. But this, this falls in line with the model I was showing you before about traumatic experiences being related to mental health, mental health be being related to sexual um, risk behavior. So, and the cross-sectional surveys are men and women. When I get to the cohort data, it's obviously just women. So um, just again, this is done in the Shabin, so they're very brief screeners, um, like the two item PHQ, PH, I was going to say nine, PHQ2, um, and a screener of seven items for PTSD, um, very high rates on screening. Men at um, half for depression, women at two thirds. Um, PTSD for screening, one quarter for men and almost a half for women. Um, I'm not showing this here, but the traumatic experiences that they endorsed were related to these mental health outcomes. Um, putting them in regressions, controlling for substance abuse. This is men looking at how, uh, the, the question here was, going back to the little visual, how is mental health related to sexual risk behavior? And so um, this is for men, even controlling for alcohol use. Um, I'm sorry, it's not highlighted very well, but um, depression was not related to sexual risk behavior for men, but PTSD was. So significant, on top of controlling for substance use in these settings where obviously a lot of alcohol is used. For women, same kind of question, both depression and PTSD um, were related to unprotected sexual activity. So just a beginning look at trying to understand and get a feel for these um, the, the people in the Shabins. So this is um, from the baseline of the cohort. So the time one for everybody. So it's the baseline for all 560 women. Um, you know, this is this is awful, but unfortunately, maybe not surprising. Virtually everybody had reported some type of traumatic event in their life. So current adult IPV interpersonal violence ranged from. 26% for sexual to 50% for emotional and physical. Uh, histories of child abuse, at least a third. And then any other violence, which of course might be um, observing murder, observing fighting, so on. So very, very high levels of traumatic experience. Given the context we were in, we wanted to look at how that was related to hazardous drinking. And so what this basically shows, these are all bolded because they're all, well, the other unexpected traumas is sort of a catch-all phrase, catch-all section. But basically those types of traumatic experiences I was talking about, if you compare for whether they were hazardous drinkers, you see people with traumatic experiences being much more, um, always more likely to be a hazardous drinker. And this was using that same data set, trying to understand, knowing that traumatic exposures are related to alcohol use, um, whether actually PTSD symptoms mediate that, that, that level of drinking and the hazardous drinking. And so it's partially mediated. Um, in other words, does the current experiencing of PTSD symptoms have something to do with overuse of alcohol? And so it's partially me mediated by it, not fully. Um, that shouldn't surprise us if we think about syndemics, right? So we wouldn't necessarily think that PTSD would be the only um, uh, predictor of various um, alcohol use or other risk behavior. So thinking back to that slide about syndemics and how various things are related to each other and interact, the reason this isn't in a graph, <laughs> we were interested in looking at how at all of these um, variables on the left were in that syndemic uh, visual that I showed you. Food insufficiency, depression, PTSD, abuse, drug use, alcohol, 
sexual risk behavior. It's basically impossible to graph because everything is associated with everything else. <laughs> so in other words, PTSD is associated with all of these other variables except actually being diagnosed with HIV or an STI. And that, that's pretty much the pattern throughout, um, which I guess in and of itself is not surprising. And this isn't surprising, but it's interesting, So that, I think. So this, this is looking at trying to get a feel for this. What, is, what, what does it mean to have this syndemic impact? And this is purely a count of the kinds of it, experiences someone had. So the 20% of these people, 11, um, had none of those um, uh, factors I had listed on the previous page. Um, and this just means like these people had seven of those. So they had like seven out of eight or seven out of seven of those possible food insufficiency, PTSD, and so on. But it's a significant linear relationship. So, so what we thought was interesting is it's a way of showing the more of these experiences you have, the more unprotected sex you have. So it was just a way of trying to begin to think about the syndemic issues. Yeah? How did you operationalize food um, That's a good question. I'd have to look at the survey exactly. But we used a measure that had like several questions about how many, the, um, how do you operationalize food insufficiency? So there are actually scales that say things like, how long did you go without eating? Or did you not eat today so your child could eat? Or you know, there's, certain, there's a number of items that go into a scale that you can actually get a sense of um, access to food and if people don't have enough food to eat. I, I'm forgetting if it has a standardized name, but um, we could certainly get them to you. Um, because there's quite a bit of literature that shows food insufficiency's relationship to HIV risk, which could play out for a number of different reasons. So this, um, we have, this study is over now. Um, we are um, beginning, um, most of what I just showed you was either a cross-sectional survey, baseline cohort. So what we're starting to do now, we have a couple of papers that are, are trying to look at change over time, right? So we have this longitudinal cohort, which not that we can necessarily determine causality, but we can start to look at things that might suggest not just associations, but a little bit more causality. So two, two studies I'll um, briefly tell you about. Um, and the purpose was, I'll tell you about two different ones, the same data, just two different questions. So whether depression, I'm sorry, I have this. So whether, is there a unique contribution of depression on alcohol use over time? So when I'm saying this, I'm talking about depression changing over time. Is that related to alcohol use changing over time? So not using a baseline as a predictor, but an analysis that allows us change over time to be, how is it associated with change in another variable over time? Um, for depression, as well as for PTSD symptoms, for this, pap for this paper, it was about how it's related to alcohol use. So we wanted basically to know, and we did bet between and within analysis. I'm not going to present all of them. I'll give you a couple of examples. But we wanted to know whether um, as a, as a group, as, as the women who were more psychologically distressed, and increasingly, at times when they were increasingly distressed, did they increase alcohol use? Same um, within individual examination. So is the likelihood of when an individual change, so uh, group or individual between. So this gives you a sense of the level of um, alcohol use using the audit. So very, like, I think 88% of these women report hazardous um, alcohol use at some point during this one year period. Um, depression, also very high using the CSD. And using, uh, for PTSD, we use the PCL. Um, and on this graph, we use a very strict cutoff of 50. For those of you who've used the PCL, that's quite high. It's a very high level of PTSD symptoms. We have references where people use 30 as the cutoff instead of 50. And that actually moves PTSD up to almost half of the people. So there's just very, even using more than the screener and standardized scales, that there are certainly high levels of distress, not surprisingly, among women in these, um, in these settings. So here's, this is one example of the findings that I personally find quite interesting, which is that there, there is an interaction between um, PTSD and depression for their alcohol use. So if you just look at depression, it's related to alcohol use. If you just look at trauma, it's related to alcohol use. However, if you put them, if you're looking at them together, there's actually a very interesting uh, interaction, which is there's a significantly higher rate of alcohol use 
when there's very high levels of PTSD. So if you, um, like if you look at depression and control for PTSD, you don't see it as related to alcohol use. Um, but if you look for the interaction, you see that. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that while there may be higher levels of depression, the greatest risk is when that coexists with PTSD. Um, and, and, a lot, and, and because I'm interested in trauma, it supports this notion of what, what should we do to address trauma in these settings. And then we did a very similar analysis that's related to um, traumatic stress as it, um, it as it relates to sexual risk behavior as the outcome. So traumatic stress being related to unprotected sex, actually related to alcohol use, and, and similar to when we looked at this in the baseline, and this is just looking at it over time, that um, alcohol use, and that analysis, we looked at PTSD symptoms, so it's looking at it a little differently. Does, does, is, is traumatic stress distally related to unprotected sex? And in this case, it's partially mediated by alcohol use. And this is at a between level comparison. So what does this mean? <laughs> this, is, this is what I, so I always hate getting to this point because it's like, this is what it means. These lives are complicated. <laughs> and HIV prevention is complicated. But so, I mean, what, um, what, I, what I, the summary of this point is that we, um, I think we, we I, I feel like we obviously know that gender inequality, relationship violence, um, we think of drinking a lot, but we don't necessarily think of treating addiction. I think it's, it's interesting to think about, and for those of you who have been in these settings, Personally, it's very depressing and difficult to be in these settings and watch what the daily lives are like of people in these settings and the sort of constant drunkenness. And we've had, if we have time, I can tell you about new ideas that have been generated out of the study that are not HIV related that have to do with fetal alcohol syndrome and children in the drinking venue and family effects of this, this um, sort of the uh, impact of alcohol and the poverty and food insufficiency. So, I mean, I think if we think just about what to do for HIV prevention, we say, okay, we have all of these factors going on, um, but, but HIV obviously doesn't exist. <laughs> it, it, it exists in syndemics as well, and so there are other health factors, and maybe that's something we're thinking about, which is how, how, do, um, how could we make the point, for, from my point of view, integrating mental health treatment um, to not only impact either uh, prevention of HIV or improved health outcomes of HIV, that there are other health outcomes that are potentially of great value to address. Um, I want to make a transition, so it, um, we can always come back to questions on this, but I, along the same line of sort of how is mental health related to um, risk behavior and health risk behavior and sort of from the HIV potentially primary prevention perspective, let me just come back to this model that was really developed for people living with HIV, this idea of mental health treatment and how is it integrated in a way that may actually improve health outcomes of people with HIV. So um, you, know, you, have to, you have to talk about the cascade, I think, right now, occasionally. <laughs> Uh, I gave this talk. I don't know. I gave this part of this talk once. I'm like, uh, how can you go this long without talking about where where do you target the drop off in the cascade? But it, but it actually, I do think it does help us frame sort of if we want to improve care engagement from the point of testing to viral load suppression. It's it's a good way to think about are there points for intervention. You say, oh, okay. Um, so just to get us in this mindset of like, are there opportune times for when mental health might actually be um, a way to um, uh, to get integrated and when might be a good time. So let me flip back to my life in Cal and Lord for a second and doing studies with gay men because um, the way I view the world is what I do with gay men in the United States actually can help inform what I do with women in South Africa. Um, it may be tailored very differently, but even the methods and the ways of thinking about things. So um, Patrick and Jessica were parts of this project called Positive Choices. And it was a small, was actually a, um, what were they called? Joe Biden signed for them. Stimulus, it was a stimulus grant. <laughs> we thanked Joe pretty regularly when we finally got this project. Um, <laughs> you know, like, thanks, Joe. We're like, thank you, Joe Biden. Thank you, Vice President Biden. Because, and we can come to this if it's important later, we, I had this idea for 10 years before it got funded. I had this idea to intervene with newly diagnosed men 
very early, like it was too early. It, people didn't see the value at the time because we weren't so, we didn't see all the great value of being fully adherent on treatment then. So anyway, eventually uh, wasn't going to get funded and then Joe Biden signed it. So it was a pilot study that now Patrick is doing on a much larger full R01 scale with Nate Hansen. But the reason I wanted to talk about this now is it was all out of this idea of when is there a window of opportunity um, in the cascade. I mean, you could probably make this, we could, we could have this discussion at a lot of different points, like in testing, in newly diagnosed, um, in once they're in care, how to retain in care. But for this particular study, we wanted, and this was actually, um, was the idea of our colleagues at Cal and Lord. So the idea was, we love your long psychotherapeutic interventions, Kathy, but <laughs> we don't have the resources to deliver them. It's not an uncommon, you can, have, you can have that issue in New York City, just like you can have in townships in Cape Town, that there are not necessarily enough resources to do the mental health delivery that I think we value, but we have to figure out ways to do it. So, um, so it was their idea to do something much briefer, um, and when might be a good time to to do that. And so I thought a lot about when brief interventions actually seem to work. And most of the ones at the time when we had this idea were brief interventions in STD clinics or just having been diagnosed with an STI or something that and there's actually a whole literature on this on like um, accidents due to alcohol use. There's windows of opportunities in ERs that sort of say there are times that and, that, and I can even think back to working with the abused women in Johannesburg, was it a window of opportunity or not? So I think it applies in a lot of settings. But um, so the idea was, could we do this brief intervention very soon after they got diagnosed, so as the identity was being developed as an HIV positive um, gay man, how could you be positive about that sexuality psychologically and integrate it very soon into um, after the diagnosis? Because there was also a good amount of data that would show that soon after diagnosis, um, within a couple of months, there's often a, even a return to risk within a year. So could you intervene very early, sort of like the adolescent study, what was the main focus? Delaying sexual debut. Like it's a much more of a primary prevention way of thinking, what can you do quickly to prevent something from happening and change of behavior? So anyway, this is a typical RCT design. They were, uh, these are the, this is the complicated part, getting them into the study basically very soon after diagnosis. Um, we wanted to have a baseline line of uh, what was their behavior from the day they got diagnosed forward because we knew the behavior would change once they knew they were HIV positive. So this is, um, this is a significant effect over time for unprotected uh, anal intercourse with HIV negative partners. Um, I didn't show the slide of what when you when you put the HIV positive partners in. Um, we have no effect. For, if you just looked for overall UAI, there was no effect, and that was because there was it was basically zero sorting. There was a great drop in three months, like in the first three months after diagnosis, a decrease in sexual risk behavior, and then a real swing up, more so in the intervention condition than the control condition that, that we think was related to zero sorting. But again, this is a pilot study and at least it's in the right direction. But the reason I interjected it here is the idea about when to do it has really impacted what I'm doing now um, in, um, in, in Bob's clinic that we're now both working in at the same place. So maybe I'll run into you there. <laughs> we tried to not make it obvious, you know, but you know it. <laughs> um, so here's what we're working on right now. And this is where it's an integration of these ideas. We're basically, we, let me just give a little context. So we obviously, we know unfortunately that there's co-occurring epidemics of HIV and sexual trauma in South Africa, particularly among women, but certainly among men as well. Um, I didn't say, but we have written some interesting paper about MSM behavior in the Shabines. You know, just didn't, didn't focus on that, but I don't want to exclude that either. Um, so, th so the idea is, uh, and we know this is mostly from um, data from probably Western studies, but. Um, we actually know now that experiencing sexual trauma is related to the experience of trauma itself, not necessarily the level of PTSD symptoms, but the experience of various traumas is actually related to HIV health outcomes. Uh, viral load, I mean, it could be mediated by adherence to care, but, but we do know that psychological factors, and it may not necessarily be psychoneuroimmunology, but there are certainly issues about people having traumatic histories that are related, we know, to HIV risk behaviors and, and more clearly now on, on, on health outcomes. So the idea is, can we actually address 
sexual trauma when at one of those points in the cascade? Is there a way, and maybe some of you have heard there's, um, in the last few years, I think in the States at least, there's been this question about can we think of HIV care as trauma-informed primary care? Like what we know about how people with trauma histories engage in care um, means they often avoid care, overuse care. There's a, there's a decent literature on the impact of, on care engagement overall. So when you think about HIV in that, can we do interventions that frame, and because we know unfortunately high rates of trauma among people with HIV, is there a way that we actually approach HIV care that's what's called trauma-informed. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're trying to do. I have an R34, you guys probably know what those are, intervention development grants to try to figure out whether we can take conceptually what worked in LIFT. So going back to the sexual trauma and HIV study that impacted sexual and alcohol and um, uh, psychological outcomes. What if we thought about that in terms of care engagement outcomes, very broadly defined? Um, so the question is, can we take what we learned from that? It may or may not be appropriate to the South African context. I mean, coping may be conceptually different. I'm not convinced that it is, but we're, we're going to spend this year trying to, um, uh, we're in the middle of doing a qualitative year that's helping us understand more about the women who have these experiences, traumatic, sexually traumatic histories um, that are in HIV care. And the idea um, is that we, for the study, what we're planning is to actually um, try to have this intervention at a point of care when they start ART. So that, that could be they're newly diagnosed. It could be that they're pregnant and found out, and so now they're on ART. It could be that they've been infected for a while, and now they've progressed, and now they're ready for ART. So the question is, and it's sort of a version of trauma-informed care when someone begins um, ARVs, uh, using it as a potential window of opportunity. Because I think, on the one hand, you could argue, and this is what we did on the first submission, and the reviewers wanted us to do it a little differently. <laughs> Talk about the reality of where grants end up, if you'd like. Because um, I, I kind of felt like there ought to be a way to come up with an intervention that could be integrated at various points. And again, from the global mental health perspective, we need to be mindful of what's feasible, who could provide this. Um, we're thinking about psychiatric nurses, but we're not sure. That's part of what we're learning in this year. Like, what, what's a com what are the resource issues in clinics? Who could deliver it? Um, we don't want it to be a burden. We want it to be integrated. But I think um, that's all what I think will come. Those are the ideas that we have. Um, but I think what we're um, and I'd be curious what you all would think about this. Um, I actually think that one of our biggest barriers is um, how to screen for sexual trauma. The how being, in this context, who's comfortable asking? Who should do the asking? How does it happen in these clinics? And so I realize that's one of the things we're dealing with right now. How do you integrate that? How much do you ask? And what's the what's a norm for doing that? Or is the resistance to doing it because there's no referrals for treatment? Or that nobody would know what to do if they knew, so let's just not ask. And so that's sort of where we are right now. But the idea is that we figure out an appropriate time for to screen for trauma, uh, sexual trauma in particularly. And then the idea would be um, uh, they get adherence counseling <laughs> in this context. And so that would be the um, control condition, potentially. And then this trauma intervention would be added on top of it. We've proposed it as a combination of individual and group in, um, sessions. We've done some individual interviews and some focus groups. And so I learned very early from the women's housing development study that um, we made a really big mistake in that study, that we, we made an assumption about what worked with men in gay bars that was not going to work at all with women in low-income housing developments. And that was the beginning of this year where we said, How, why did they fund us? This makes no sense. We have to do this differently. That I don't think we'll end up that way in this current study, but at least I'm just saying to those of you as like if you ever hit that point in the first grant that you have oh my god how did they fund me none of this is going to work i made a wrong assumption that that happens don't return the money <laughs> don't return the money no definitely don't return the money um but but think about what you can learn and so like what i've been saying to my team is let's let's do these interviews and let's do the focus groups what i learned in the housing developments where women were saying we will never talk to each other we don't know each other we don't trust each other why would we and i always say why would i knock on my neighbor's door and start talking about sexual behavior just because we live in an inner city housing development together. I mean, of course, none of that's going to happen. 
But we watched them talk to each other once we created an infrastructure for them to be together. So I think that um, what we're doing, where we are in this project now, is watching the process happen. And I guess that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you listen to what you've been told, but you always observe what's happening in the process. So, so what we hope, I mean, uh, the um, what we hope will happen is that it's a little bit similar in design in some ways to the positive choices study because it's about coming into at the point where you're going to get ART being baseline to this experimental condition. This may change. It is the beauty of an intervention development grant. I mean, it may be a different number of sessions, might be shorter, might be longer. They already have liked coming to a focus group, so could we bring women together? Would that actually really be possible? Because I'm a big believer in the benefit of the group. Um, but so that, and the outcomes would be, um, the, the innovation in it is can you, can you basically have some form of treatment for sexual trauma tailored to care engagement in a way that increases adherence and coming for care and so on. But we would, of course, measure traumatic stress, coping, and various risk behaviors. So just to say um, thank you to all these people, many faces who are probably familiar. So, <laughs> um, so this actually is our PC team. Um, part of our PC team, there's Patrick. Arlene Kochman was the woman who um, I did all my studies with, and she died unexpectedly last year. So Patrick has made a transition in doing our projects without her, um, which is sad. But she made all things run for about 15 or more years. Um, this is the uh, couple of us from the Duke side with um, in one of the Shabines with the South African staff. And then these are some of our collaborators in common, um, uh, Dan Stein and John Jessica. So I'll leave it there with the faces. Thank you.